Good day to you all, wherever you are. I hope you're well and surviving this extended lockdown here in the UK. It's rather a special day for me. Today, being the 2nd of March, is a year since I lost my freedom. I was in London at meetings at the BIS headquarters and was supposed to go on to a talk at the American Embassy and a reception at Canada House. But on the underground, I felt I was the only one who was uh, taking the threatened pandemic seriously. And uh, so I decided to head straight for home and I've been here ever since. But I'm glad to say that fortunately, my wife and I have both had our first vaccinations. So we're beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the society, but now as chair of the events committee, I try to keep all the events and activities going, and I'm always on the lookout for interesting and forward-looking talks. Anyway, welcome to this, the British Interplanetary Society's 15th live-streamed evening lecture since March and April of last year. We've got a lot planned for the rest of the year, with our virtual Beyond the Moon Symposium on the 12th of April, Cosmonauts Day, and we still have room for a couple more papers. Then on the 28th to 30th of June, we're hoping to run our Reinventing Space Conference in the QE2 Conference Center in Westminster, face-to-face -face with, of course, the required social distancing. The call for papers closed last week, but details of the event and ticketing information will be available on our BIS website shortly. I'll tell you more about that at the end if we have time. Please use the question system to answer your questions anytime during the talk because we are using Crowdcast throughout both for the presentation and for the, uh, uh, for the Q and A. As most of you know, the vote button is also on the Q&A, the questions there, so you can vote for the questions you really want to hear to go to the top of the list by clicking on the vote button. I'm pleased to say that we have with us tonight Dr. Tommaso Parinello from Isa Ezrin. He's going to tell us about the changes of our planet seen from space, but I won't say anything more. I'm going to hand over to Fabrizio to do the introductions and get the show on the road. Over to you, Fabrizio. Hello, Alistair. Hello, Tommaso. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Alistair. And uh, yes, we are very, very pleased to have uh, Tommaso Parinello that I, I'm proud to be calling by name Tommaso because I know him since a long, very long period. Tommaso is an outstanding career in ESA. He's more 28 years in, in, in ESA, starting from it as a physicist, a PhD in, uh, in Dundee in the UK. So it's a very nosy environment, let's say. <laughs> and, uh, and now he's, uh, after a stint as a spacecraft operation engineer in ESOT, uh, he went to become a mission manager for the Cryosat 2 mission. And then recently he also accepted the, the management role together also for the EOLUS mission. Both of them are two outstanding and unique missions of ESA, very unique in the world. Cryosa to measure the ices and uh, EOLUS measure the upper atmosphere winds with the technologies that nobody has ever put into space before. So uh, it's, a, it's a daunting task what he has to do. So being mission manager for two missions is very difficult. But also uh, Tommaso has this uh, uh, fantastic attitude towards science and also outreach. And also he sees also the implication because his role is not only to manage the mission, but also to connect with the science community and to present the results to his and also to other, other very specialized places and congresses. So his view on uh, what are the results of this mission and what are their role in our future are very, very important. Tommaso has been also very important for our local group, the BIS Italia, the, the BIS uh, branch we manage. I manage in Italy, actually. And uh, because for a few years, we shared uh, the ground of the same events that Tommaso has invented in Sicily, in Agrigento, his hometown, and uh, close to his hometown, sorry. And, uh, and we did a wonderful outreach events talking about space and astronomy in the valleys of Temple, which is a fantastic place that everybody should visit. It's one of the cultural heritage places of the world. Tomas is also a keen astrophotographer, so he's a, 
it's fantastic equipment. He never speak about that, but I know that he has wonderful <laughs> stuff. So, it's, uh, I hope everybody will enjoy his presentation. The format will be the usual. Tommaso will give the presentation now. It's going to last about one hour. You can start putting questions in the Ask a Question using the Ask a Question button down the screen, and then we will uh, read the question and he will answer them. Compatible with the time available, of course. So, Tomas, it's up to you. Thanks a lot for joining, and especially considering how busy you are, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Fabrizio. It's my pleasure today to be here. Now I have the most difficult task is to share my screen and not to screw up everything. So this is my screen. And now I have to launch the presentation. And now please tell me that everything is working fine. Can you see it's perfect. the it's earth perfect. on the left? And you can see, perfect. So, well, what can yeah. I say? Thank you very much for this, uh, for this nice presentation. I would like to thank the British Interplanetary Society today for inviting me to deliver this lecture, which is in my intention to be a virtual real introduction journey together to the observation of Earth in from space. We will see, in fact, uh, some examples of how important it is to monitor our planet from space and which tools do we have today to accomplish this. The second part of the presentation will be, of course, dedicated to climate change and I'll say its main consequences on our life. I have already been introduced by Alistair and, uh, and by um, Fabrizio, so I think I can easily skip this part and I think I will start now my uh, presentation, my next slide. Okay, I would like to start by making uh, some initial consideration. We probably today don't realize how much our society and even I will say our daily activities depend today on space technology. Once this was used, I would say, primarily by scientists or by researchers, but today it has become fundamental, I would say, part of our life. Every time we need to, uh, to interrogate, for example, the weather before we go out, or we want to exchange information from remote places, we need a satellite network. And the same, of course, if we need to provide support to complicated areas, or simply we want to watch the World Cup sitting in our home, or we want to have information about the traffic or road conditions before we set out on a journey. These are simple examples where we resort today to satellite technology and networks. Now, imagine how dull would be today our world without social media, Facebook, Twitter, anything you can mention. But how more difficult it would have been to face an emergency like we have today without the exchange of information between international communities, without satellite technology, without a satellite network. Well, all of this could be interrupted easily and suddenly. What I'm saying is not, I would say, science fiction, but it's something really that can happen and is unpredictable. Something similar happened, for example, in 1959, when a strong magnetic solar storm hit our planet and caused disasters on ground. Telegraph wires, the eye technology stuff at that time suddenly sorted, shorted out, in, especially in the United States and Europe. So all these regular tasks, which we consider today to be like commodities and we take for granted, can disappear or be heavily impacted. Now, this demonstrates, I don't want to be any, and do any kind of terrorism today, but this demonstrates very easily the fragility of our society with respect to technology and to progress, which, of course, in one hand, wants to improve the quality of our life, and it's able to do this, and we can see it clearly. We are now better than we were probably 50 years ago. But on the other hand, makes us really totally dependent on it. Fragility is an important concept when we observe our planet, and this concept will be repeatedly used and will emerge throughout all this presentation. Now, the importance of understanding our planet works and how our planet works and, uh, and try to understand how which impact this has on our society, our lives, I will say our even survival has really motivated all space agencies in the world 
to invest in satellite technology to monitor our planet. Now, ESA is the organization which I belong to. It's among the protagonists, I will say, of this important strategy and has several satellites in orbit and many other in development. You can see the numbers on this slide. And my, the scope of this presentation is to show you some example of how important this is. However, I must say that it has no way, not always been like this. At the beginning of the space era, the primary objectives, as you know, was to win the space race because it meant showing supremacy between United States and the Soviet Union, not only from a technological point of view, but was also, uh, I would say, a race between two models of society, liberalism and communism, which had in the Cold War its main expression. Now, once this has reached, once we landed on the moon, once we have done all this, the next objectives of the space agency primarily was to explore the planets of our system. This is not to say that there were no missions which were going to, which were monitoring uh, Earth, but the prime focus was not Earth at that time. Now, the situation changed a little bit at the beginning of the 70s, actually a little bit before that. And it's believed that this photo, which was taken by Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve 1968, was a complete change in perspective. For the first time, a photo taken from another celestial boat, from, from I'll say a spacecraft orbiting another celestial body, showed the fragility and uniqueness of our planet. There's no other planet today that we know where people, well, living species are living. There might be, I'm pretty sure they are somewhere there, but today this is the only ship we have where we all live there. In that picture, it's all the species which have left since the beginning of life up to 1968. So it became immediately clear to billions of people around the world how this, how this important this planet is. And in fact, sorry, it is believed that this photo marked the birth of the environmental movement worldwide, which today in climate change, in climate change time era is playing an important role in raising, I will say, the awareness about this problem. But the very first sign that, that someone or some, um, uh, that was showing that something really was changing on Earth was documented and was documented because, as you know, science is about facts, is about data, is about repetitivity, is about numbers. Well, this first sign was offered, I would say almost by chance, by Professor Keeling, who was responsible for um, an astronomical observatory in the Hawaii. In a conference in 1972, so not 200 years ago, but just like 40 years ago, more or less, he presented this curve, which you on the horizontal axis is the year, and on the vertical axis is the CO2 or carbon dioxide concentration. And he said during his presentation that, uh, gentlemen, I am measuring CO2 since, and my colleagues since 1952, and uh, what we are seeing is that the level of carbon dioxide measured since 1952 is increasing. It did not have an explanation. It did not have a clue why this was happening. But what he said is that at net of these oscillations, which are seasonal dependence, he can see a trend. Actually, he said it's not even a linear trend. It is accelerating, and it's if you if you can read through the text, it says it has a cubic, I would say, evolution, which is there's some acceleration going on. So again, this was the first time ever that a scientist demonstrated with a paper in a conference that something was changing on our planet in this contemporary time. We'll say a planet that up to that moment was believed to have a stable climate or a climate that changed slowly due to known causes or due to his millennium cycles. We will go through those eventually, but was known to be dependent strongly on the composition of the atmosphere. Now, as said, with that image of Apollo in 1968, there was a con another complete change of perspective. Therefore, the Earth began to be one of the main focus of the space programs. And in fact, immediately this was known, the atmosphere was the weakest point of the climate. Now, the atmosphere is just this 100 kilometer thick layer of gas, which is 
on which is floating around the earth and it's indeed it is the basis of our life of our survival because we are all built and we have evolved in a certain way because the atmosphere today has a certain concentration concentration of gases when the hand the atmosphere i will say hundreds of millions years ago was different we had different species we didn't have mammals so by monitoring our planet today of course we have to we have to look at the atmosphere and what we have found on one hand is really fascinating but on the other hand it really concerns and originates a lot of concern let's see some examples let me fact start from the atmosphere as the first image i want to show you today on average and why is atmosphere important well it is considered like if you want the skin of our planet on average we breathe 20 times a minute so the quality of the air is an important factor of our health and for the quality of our life some studies show that even the mortality rate can be up to nine percent linked to the quality of air and there are places in europe where the expectancy of life is 18 months lower than average and even places when this is 36 months lower what I'm showing here has been seen, monitored by a, by a satellite of the ESA European Union called Sentinel-5. This, this orbit P, Sentinel-5P, this orbits the Earth at about 800 kilometers from ground, and it's capable of measuring different concentrations of gases. One of the most important one is called nitrogen, uh, nitrogen dioxide, which is called NO2, which is NO2 in chemical. And syntax. The image shows here, in fact, the concentration of this chemical compound. And when you where you see red means high concentration. When you see yellow, medium concentration, and other colors mean no. Now the, the image, as I said, shows the concentration of this compound, chemical compound, which is really toxic. It is known that long exposures to elevated, I would say, concentrations of this gas may contribute to the development of asthma and potential increase of respiratory, respiratory infections and diseases. It is generated by industry waste, the generation of electricity, emissions of cars, engines, and therefore traffic. Usually it precipitates on ground after some weeks, but if it reaches the, uh, the stratosphere, it can stay up to 100 years before it is broken. So it's something which can stay a lot, I'll say more than the lifetime of a person in the atmosphere. And if you look at this image, and let me try to go here. Actually, no, before we go there, yes. And if you look at this image, you can see even here the roots. I know, I'm not sure you can see my cursor, I hope you can. You can see, apart from the cities, of course, and these areas which are very high polluted, but you can even see the roots of the planes going to um, America, the routes of the sea, of the sorry, of the ships, which are basically navigating our planet. If I just try to zoom in, so it gets, I, I would say, a European uh, way, um, I would say, context, you see how, how we are polluted. And look at Germany, look at Italy, the city, Rome, Naples. You can just pick up all the main cities, London area, um, uh, UK, you can see again the routes. I mean, you, you know that these are the routes uh, um, navigated by the ships. So everything gets really clear just by looking at what we are producing. We don't even need to know where the cities are geographically. We just need to point. And we are pretty sure that all these points here red are cities. Now, there's no doubt that, that what we see today, today it's not of nature, made, not, not made by, by nature, but it's of anthropo, anthropo, made by human beings and anthropogenic nature, if you want. And an example I want to show you is this one here. It's, uh, again, a comparison, the satellite is the same, of NO2, which is uh, nitrogen dioxide, um, before and do before and during the lockdown so is an example of italy but you can find really if you go to the ESA pages you can find example of not only any place in europe but even in the world and what you see on the left is march 2019 um, i would say a normal day of march 2000 i think it's even an average 
And what you see on the right, it's March 2020, when in Italy, we just started to get into the peak of the lockdown. You can immediately see the changes. And there are places where even 60% of reduction was measured. Now, while in Europe and in April last year, we were observing this reduction of pollution at a certain point in China, which had the lockdown before, if you remember the history of the pandemic. Um, we, what we saw in April that in China, there was a slowly recovery of the pollution, why we had a reduction in Europe, because they were getting out of their lockdown. So people were, start, were basically trying to go back to work, the energy production restart and so on. So for the first time, the increase of pollution in China was a positive signal for us because it clearly told us that we can get out of this pandemic tunnel. Clearly, it was a sign of hope. But there are different, I would say, kind of lockdowns and not all lockdowns are the same. The left image, it's a, again, I'm showing here um, concentration of NO2. On the left side of the image, you see a reduction. And this was re with respect, I think, to 2018, 2019. And this was uh, measured in uh, 2020. So it's a kind of, I would say, different, uh, different values between that time and the reference periods of two years before. We see in blue, it means that there was a substantial a, a substantial um, uh, decrease. And this was in spring. Now, on the right side, it is, again, it's a situation in autumn 2020, when there was less restrict, I would say, restricted lockdowns were imposed by the governments in Europe. And what surprisingly we saw, that in most places, the concentration in autumn, which was in a kind of a soft lockdown, which even was even higher than previous years, and this told, tells us basically that perhaps a soft lockdown, that, uh, that during a soft lockdown, that either people behavior was not really compliant to the rules, or basically there could be other reasons which analysts may, uh, may want to look into this. For example, an important uh, source of NO2 is volcanic eruptions. And Etna, in the last weeks, had uh, shown an incredible nature, I would say, um, event, but it's really now getting a bit annoying people over there in Sicily. And, but in the last last weeks, have released tons and tons of this gas of NO2, which is now covering the whole peninsula. So the main message here is that we are watching you and we know what you're doing from space. Now, there are other satellites, of course, and instruments which are designed to study and to monitor other elements of our planet. I'm here just giving you an example about the oceans. For example, in November last year, a satellite called Sentinel-6 was launched to measure the oceans and provide fundamental parameters which regards waves, currents, and also measure the rise of the sea level. Now, without spoiling, of course, the conclusion of this presentation, you know that uh, already, but I will show you that one of the direct consequences of global warming is exactly that. The image shown here is instead captured by another satellite called Sentinel-3, and which is able for a ra from, um, 700 kilometers above the Earth to measure the temperature of the sea surface with a resolution better than 0 0.5 degree. Red means here cold, sorry, warm water. Blue means cold. And it's important to measure continuously and have this kind of map to see how the oceans are evolving in time. Oceans are important because they cover 71% of the Earth's surface. They collect 97% of the planet's fresh water, not to mention, of course, that they host a great, incredible number of species. Ocean exchange energy, heat, material with other systems like the atmosphere, so they are very interlinked between them. They are crucial for any process on our planet. The oceans are also a great absorber of gases like CO2, which we come to this later, which are dissolved in water. And around one third, 30% of CO2 produced naturally or by human activities are absorbed today, are absorbed by the oceans. And if the temperature of the oceans increases, a major quantity of carbon dioxide 
can be released because the, solub the solubility of this gas in the water falls and therefore the ocean itself has less possibility capability to to uh, absorb and um, co2 ocean has oceans has also significant economic and political importance if you think that over 3 billion people 40 percent of the world population depends on the health of the seas think of fishing but also things of activities just maritime transport renewable energy tourism and you can mention more more and more and more activities it is thought that the value of the economy of the ocean and this is why it's important to understand how this is changing how the how the oceans are changing well the value of the economy is prop is the seventh world um, seventh in the world economy which means that if there was uh, if it was a nation it would sit in g7 by means of satellite we're able also to 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 create a global mapping of the biomass of our planet which allows us for example to um, monitor the state of the certification of some areas of the world, monitor the state of the forest that are important resources for our society, just think how many things around us are built or made or use wood, houses, infrastructure, energy, heating, any objects, just look around you and you find definitely something which is made of trees. And most of all, it is the kingdom, kingdom of many living species including also people. Now, mapping the biomass is also important to monitor crops. And by combining this information with other democratic, um, demographic information, and for example, public health, it is possible to produce map like this one, which gives you an information about demand versus availability of food and water, which is becoming more and more a precious element. And this, all this is fundamental to prevent famine and other important issues. Now, thanks, uh, I will say thanks here to, uh, to the fact that we are integrating several data and, and also thanks, I will say, to the digital revolution, the so-called precision farming or precision agriculture is now days becoming and very successful. It's basically using data from different sources and using algorithms like artificial intelligence that resources can be exploited, I would say, with better sustainability. For example, the constant mapping of humidity of the soil, which can, we can today be carried out globally from space, we have a mission which does that in ESA, which is called SMOS, it allows farmers, for example, to utilize at best their water resources and this in time of a climate change where the where the uh, say the process of these certifications is accelerating it is really really quite important deforestation is clear a threat and this is what we are seeing from space is a clear threat to people and nature the certifications is never stopping it is either caused by nature or by humans or by humans activities here is an example seen from space, but there are many, many uh, around the world. And even there are websites which are constantly using data from satellites and constantly giving this important information also to the people who are basically at the top of the, go of the world governments. This is an area, just to give an example, as I said, I can show you many others. This is an area of Brazil, which is, if you want to give you, it's like 1.5 times the size of Wales. Um, I will many times use, I will say, the UK comparisons to give some idea because today I am the host of the British Interplanetary Society. Now, what you see in, is a comparison of these two images, left and right, between 2001 and 2012, only 11 years. And you can see there that we have the deforestation made by human activities is clearly visible. I mean, I will say that we have lost around 45, 40, 50 percent of forest. While the graph in the left bottom here, I hope you can see my cursor, shows basically the rates of deforestation. We had a peak at the beginning of this century, which then recovered. So it's going down. But but since 2000, with a minimum 2012, but since then it is now slowly increasing. It's clear that the governments who are ruling these countries have a major impact, a role in trying to preserve um, these assets. Now, in order to carry out deforestation, sometimes it's often 
trees are often uh, burned down and uh, as well as forests and this has an, an, a tremendous i would say impact on the environment but not only the social and economic will say effect are equally disastrous just these fires can be seen from space and what you see here is the color red means and from red to yellow it's it means the different density of fires per day per hectare which are monthly um, I would say activated in, in 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 our planet and if you see if you see this from space and when I saw this animation I said well earth is not made of water it's it's really on fire and it's amazing how many how many trees are burned every every week every day now the effect of burning trees of burning biomass it has is twofold the reduction, the reduction of the planet's ability to absorb carbon dioxide, because it's very important, and also as they're becoming a significant source of CO2 during, due to combustion. Now let me go, let me change completely subject, and I just want to, let me get the water. Now I just put this provocative question here, is the Earth spherical? And it's a question there for many reasons. And, and I hope you would first agree with me that Earth is not flat. If you don't agree, I will ask the British Interplanetary Society to organize another event and I can show you why the planet is not flat. But this is not the point. The point is that if we look at our planet from the, I would say, the gravity point of view, not only Earth is not flat, but it's not even spherical. What you see here is an image of uh, the gravity, the geopotential field, which is the gravity field where all points have the same gravity of our planet, which was measured by a satellite uh, called Gauge, which has re-entered in space some years ago. So from a point of view of gravity, that is exactly to say the force of the attraction that Earth acts on another object having mass, Therefore, the force that satellite allows satellites to orbit our planets. And if you want, the same force that act on Newton's apple falling from the tree. Our planet has more a shape of a potato, a tuber, than a sphere. And if we look this in two dimension, and this map is called the geoid, which is the equipotential gravity map of our planet. Now, this is in fact what our planet looks from space when we measure gravity. It is, the, you can see the gravity hills, you can see the gravity valleys, which have nothing to do with geographical distribution. However, they have some links, of course, because the distribution is linked to mass. Areas with blue would have less gravity than red. Therefore, a person standing in the blue area would jump slightly higher than the person standing on the red zone, giving the same, I will say, energy. The force of gravity, it's, not only important for the for satellite to, I would say, to navigate around the, our planet, but also is very important on the planet because it is an important element for the distribution of currents on the water of our planets. Now, I want to give this example because in my mind, it is a perfect example that enables us and you to understand how a pure scientific result like this has a wide application for us. And you might ask yourself, what is this application? Well, this map is in fact in our smartphones because a gravitational map, the geoid, is important for the accuracy when we navigate, for example, using Google Map or any other similar application. The GPS, GPS uses accurate gravitational map. And this today, believe me, is the most accurate I would say in the market to better positions where we are. So every time now you navigate, you switch your TomTom -tom or your Google map, just think that you're carrying on in your device an idea, an idea which came 20 years ago in the mind of engineers and allowed to build this, to build this incredible satellite. So from an idea, we had an incredible space technology built, launched, stayed in around the earth if i remember three four years then we entered and the result of this is in our small device 
Now, going back to what we said at the beginning, the importance of being able to manage water resources, <clears throat> take a look what is happening today in Mexico City. This is an image of 2014, but the situation has really not changed since then. And what is happening is really owing to, to I would say, an unsustainable, bad management of the use of the water. The image shows the phenomena of subsidence, which is it's a vertical movement of the ground due to natural causes or human activities. Of course, I am about the human activities. The satellite image says here that there are areas colored by red on the south of the city in which the ground is falling by 2.5 centimeters a month. And it's not due, of course, to natural causes, but it's due to human being. Water has been extracted from the underground reservoir without giving them the chance to refill. Now, this is not only a phenomenon which is affecting Mexico cities. I can show you phenomenon which, which, of course, is affecting Rome, Paris, in London, I believe, Venice. The phenomena is not only affecting, as I said, the city, but a recent publication on signs, and I was really astonished to read that, it says that almost more, almost 200 cities of 34 countries in the world are suffering from subsidence due to bad management of water resources. And there are not less, I wrote the numbers here to be sure, 630 million, almost two thirds of a billion people will suffer, suffer uh, within the next decade, decade about this problem with an economic risk of 10,000 billion euros. So what I'm trying to say here is that we do really doing our best to make our future worse. Okay, this is what you get when you got subsidies. It's like a, an earthquake wave. And just going to the earthquake, not always, of course, is man's fault. Uh, Sometimes natural disasters can happen and some of them are unpredictable. And in this case, I want to show you the, the earth, what happened, what can we see from an earthquake? And this case is the one which hit the central Italy some years ago, destroying assets, people, lives, um, houses, roads, and putting the life of survival of those who have survived in an incredible distress. And they're still in distress, I would say. Now, satellites in this case can really give an enormous contribution to save lives and assets. The color you see here represents the different, well, the vertical displacement of the ground. So these are cities um, who, who live close to Rome, who are Italian, know what I'm talking about. There are Matrice, there are Norcia, Castelluccio. They are cities which really suffered from the central, um, uh, uh, from this earthquake some years ago. So Rome, it's on, it's on your left, if you want. So it's on, yes, it's on your left bottom left. Now, what you see here is the vertical displacement of the ground following the earthquake. So we can make differences of where was the ground before and where is the ground now. And red means 30 centimeters. So the whole central part, central of the tectonic fault line rose by almost 30 centimeters. But not only, we can also measure horizontal displacement. And what this image says is that the ground moved 20 centimeters to the left towards the Tyrrhenian Sea and 20 centimeters more or less to the right towards the Adriatic Sea. And all this you can see in the middle, the line of the tectonic, the tectonic fault line. So that earthquake, imagine the energy, that earthquake for thousands of kilometers square pushed up the ground by 30 centimeters and displaced 30, 25 centimeters on the left and 25 centimeters on the right. An incredible amount of energy, an incredible capacity of destruction. Now, improving the quality of our life and preserving our natural, preserving natural and man-made heritage, I will say, it is an important element, a prerogative, I will say, of every mission, every space mission today, which is committed to observe our planet. In particular, monitoring, for example, extreme weather conditions, which are becoming more frequent owing to climate change is a must. And for this reason, one of the missions that I am responsible for is called AOLUS. 
is exactly doing this. It's the beauty of technology, which I unfortunately I, will, I don't have time here to explain, but believe me, measuring wind directly using laser and just collecting 250 photons in the receiver to understand what is the velocity of the, of the molecules, which have backscattered the energy. 250 photons. While I'm speaking to you, you have billions of billions of photons hitting your retina. Here, I'm just, the satellite is able to count that amount of photons and get from this information the wind. Well, we don't have time to speak about the technology, but definitely what I like to speak here to tell you is that it is important to predict weather. It's important to predict extreme weather events. And what ALUS is doing today, and this is one of his main objectives, is to, um, to do this and to calculate in advance the track of the hurricanes. All this can save lives and assets for billions of billions of euros. And I like to sometime, well, to, to really to give you the idea how much these missions cost, because people come back, sometimes people have the fa this famous question we get every time, why are we spending so much to, to go to Mars? Why are we spending so much to do all this? Well, the, my objective today and in, in many presentations is to give you a feeling how important it is to do these things because you get a return of investment already back. Uh, if we just want to talk about fund money, economy, well, it is demonstrated that for every euro or pound, you're now outside euro, yeah, uh, Europe, EU, um, every, every one euro we uh, invest, we get three euros back in technology and economy, not to mention because it's priceless. There's no price, I will say, the, the, uh, when, we say when these technology is used to save human beings. So it's, it's, it's really important that we continue, uh, we continue not only for a scientific point of view, but also, I will say, for a societal point of view, that we continue in space, in, in, in investing in space technology. Okay, this comes now to the second part of my presentation. Of course, this is an introduction. I will say that the first part was an introduction. I could have shown you really thousands of examples, but of course we only have one hour and it's not, an, it's not a course, it's not a, a university course. So in one hour, I will, I'm here just to give you a flavor how, how fantastic space technology is and what kind we get, what kind of information we can get for it. And if you, if you really want to know more, just drop an email to me and I'm happy to speak to you and give you more and more example. Now let's come to, to this second part here, which is about, of course, if I'm, if I'm just talking about climate change, I have to talk about climate change, it is clear. And as I said, we have reached now this second part. And when we refer to this word climate change, we refer to the fact that our Earth's temperature is changing and it's rising and because this is important because it's the temperature really which is driving the force of climate like for anything else and temperature means heat it means energy so our climate because of that is changing now let's look at this issue and see for the first see already which state is telling us for example how much and where and how is the, our, uh, is the average temperature of our planet changing or rising? Now, I want to show you an animation here, which shows, uh, let me see if it works. I hope you can see this animation. Well, I hope so. Now, the, the animation I'm showing here reports the historical variation of the temperature anomaly in the last 140 years with respect to a given period. And you can see here, Oops, okay, finished. So the animation shows three facts. Now the animation stops, so we can see these facts. On average, there has been a constant increase of temperature, which you can measure by this thickness of this curve. Okay, you can see my mouse. So on average, there has been a constant increase of temperature since 1880, with some oscillations, of course. The rise is, of temperature is almost identical in any given month of the year. On average and globally, the rise of temperature does not depend, therefore, on the month. So summer, winter, January, March, April, on average, the same. 
half of the record years with extreme heat, and you can, these are the record years on the right, begin in the 80s. Now we can see similar in, uh, information in another graph. I hope I can show you this. Yes, it's here. Again, you see years on the solar horizontal scale. You see temperature anomaly. We refer, we refer to a period, 1951, 1918. What you see here is the difference between what is measured at any time and that reference period. Beyond the natural oscillations, the trend is clear. And if we look at the last decay of the temperature, so the last part of this graph, okay, um, we see that the 10 hottest, hottest years were in the last 15 years, and the last five years were the last were and the last five hottest years were in the last five years. Now, before I continue with this, I just want to make remark one thing which is very important. This data here is nothing which I have done, I have made, but is a collection of data of thousands of thousands of scientists throughout all the years, which are comparing this data. Is there, they are publishing papers, they are reviewing these papers amongst them. And so this data, um, they are collected by scientists, uh, independent of their race, their color, their cultural, their religion, uh, religion or whatsoever. It's a it is a collection of, inc of, of independent information and data. And this is the beauty of science. Now, another question which can be uh, that we can ask ourselves is the following. Is the rise of the planet temperature uniform? Well, the answer is no. Not only the, the is not uniform. So there are different places on the planet where the temperature is less or greater or bigger. But there are even places where it is two times to three times greater than the average value. And where is this place? Well, this place is, this happens, unfortunately, I will say, in the Arctic. Now, the image you see here is, is the, what is, um, is the difference between, I will say, the uh, uniform, the average, the global average, which has increased by 1.1 degrees since uh, 1850, and the local anomaly of the temperature. This phenomenon, and you can see red means higher, up to two times, 2.5 times, and blue means less. So we have yellow means more or less it's the global average. So just by looking at this image without me telling you anything, you can even you can immediately notice that in the north part of our planet we have a, a, a phenomenon in which, on average, the temperature is two times greater than the average global temperature. Now this phenomenon, which ho whose origin is not only is not only climate climatic, but also meteorological. There are different causes, root causes, why this happens. And of course, not all of them are known for sure. For example, it is known that uh, an increase of the energy transport from the equator towards the North Pole is happening as a result of the increase of frequency of, of hurricanes. And this because the temperature is rising and so the frequency of hurricanes is becoming higher because the surface of the ocean, remember the ocean, is becoming higher as well. And this is causing the atmosphere of those regions to be warmer. You may ask why this is not happening in the Antarctic. You get, a, you get an answer to this question when we go to the Antarctic. And as a result also, and due to the fact that the, the humidity has fallen, um, in the last years, but this is a meteorological event, we can see fires now. We can see fires above the Arctic Circle. And we can see fires from, not from the airplanes, we can see fires from the satellites. And this again is another contribution of carbon dioxide, which we did not have before. Now, on average, you can see the, the, the Antarctic continent is blue, it's not warming globally, but there's an area which is our concern of our scientists, and I'm just pointing this with a, sorry, no, no, no. I'm pointing this with this arrow here. This is a, this is a, a, a place where there is some concern because although the, they will say Antarctica, the continent is not warming globally, there's an area which 
uh, it is. And this is not due to this, the amplification of uh, like in Arctic, but it's something which I will tell you when we go to the ice. So overall, this phenomenon, as you can see, is has an incredible dramatic effect on what? On ice. And let's have a look at that. So let's go to the Arctic, North Pole, very close to us, very close to Europe. Actually, uh, there are places where as part of Europe, I would say. The Arctic is like a huge closed ocean surrounded by land. The oceans are mostly covered by floating sea ice, whose thickness is around between 50 centimeters to three, four meters. The ice is seasonally, um, is seasonal and its extension varies throughout the year. Some part is reproduced during winter to then melt in summer. Excuse me. So this variation of the variation of the extension stimulates the transport and of the energy and substance throughout the Arctic currents because you have Arctic currents like a gyro inside here. And this is also fed, I would say, by the rivers of the northern lands. And the currents like a vortex, there's a real vortex, there's a color gyro, buffo gyro here, transport and re-steer all this and redirects them through the Atlantic. Now, this creates and maintains, I would say, a unique biodiversity in the world, and unique, I would say, but it's also characterized by a fragile balance, which today it's in danger because of the global warming. And what do I mean by that? Now, let's see what's happening there. During the, these years, satellite data have provided measurements that have shown that the sea ice is decreasing constantly. Now, this graph shows uh, starting from 1975 to today, showing how the concentration of sea ice um, is changing over time. In the last 40 years, we have lost a quantity of sea ice equal to 3 million kilometers square, which, if you want, is like 12 times the, the size of the United Kingdom, or equivalent to one-third of the extension of the continent to Europe from the columns of Hercules, Gibraltar, if you want, to, the, to, to Moscow. On average, every year we lose a quantity which is equal to the size, I'll say, of Scotland. I hope I've done my, my homework well. I think it's the size of Scotland or the size of Austria. And in September 2020, we measured the second worst result ever recorded. The trend is linear and it's falling. This is without any doubt. Now, the melt of the melting of the sea ice as an additional and evident complication because a small quantity of sun rays are reflected from the clear surface, the white clear surface of the ice and of the snow, which is then absorbed by the ocean, which traps this energy and slowly releases again to the atmosphere. The atmosphere gets warmer, more, more, more heat, less ice or snow, which means again that um, basically we get in what the, the scientists call, uh, I would say, uh, a positive feedback. So it's, it's like acting, like acting and activating, I would say, a cascade effect. Less snow, so yo, it's called albedo, scientists call this albedo. Less albedo means more energy trapped in the ocean, which is released in the atmosphere, warms up the atmosphere, melts more, melts more or uh, more ice or more snow. So it's really a, a catch-22 situation if you want, and it's creating something which could be really uncontrolled. But it's not only the sea ice extension which is disturbing, I would say, the nights and making um, nightmares to the, to the science community. In addition to this, there's also a decrease in the sea ice Thickness. And you can see here comparison between 1979 on your left and 2020. The thickness, the sea ice thickness, and the thickness of the sea ice in the Arctic is around, as I said, maximum three to four meters, is, uh, is creating an issue because we also see a decrease in the sea ice thickness and uh, which of, uh, of the multi annual ice, which is the ice which outlives the summer season. Now, this is important because it is a key indicator of climate change because it contains a vast quantity of fresh water. When it melts, the fresh water, 
When I mean fresh, I don't mean cold. I mean fresh without means, without salinity. Mix it with the salt water in different quantities and at different times compared to what happened in the past, impacting, um, impacting the, the, I will say, a fundamental role in the exchange between the energy, between the, sorry, the exchange of energy between the atmosphere and the ocean. And all this has an impact not only on the Arctic circulation of the ocean, but on the circulations of the of, uh, of all the currents on our planet. Because you have to think of the currents like a conveyor's belt or highways or rivers which flows into the water. Now, the mass of this water involved in the circulation transport energy, heat, uh, materials, uh, particles, uh, dissolved particles, gases, and have an incredible capacity to influence significantly both the earth, both earth climate and the marine biology. You manage this belt of warm water which is trying to redistribute the energy around our planet. Now the currents are generated by the variation of density of the masses of water which is at the same which is determined by mainly by the difference of temperature and difference of salinity. Probably the famous Gulf, um, sorry, current we know is the Gulf Current. It transports hot water from the tropical zone to the latitude north of our continent, almost sliding on the surface. It's like a river. This allows that the climate, in, climate is mild in the north of Europe, UK, Iceland, would not have that temperature in, in winter without the Gulf Current. In the areas of Greenland and Iceland, this water like sinks because uh, it's of low temperature, becomes colder, and also due to the high level of salinity caused by the formation of the marine and continental ice pack. Bending back moves towards the equator and then mixes with other currents and so on. Now, this because the I would say the, the phenomenon of building and melting ice is changing and is shifting also in time and becoming less and less this can have an impact on, on, uh, on the current. As a matter of fact, just recently, there was a study on nature geoscience, which suggests that the Gulf current is weakening. And as a result, there, would be, there could be colder winters in Europe, which seems to be like a paradox. It's, we are talking about global warming, but the effect of global warming is colder winters in Europe. And sometimes those who do not believe that we are in a time of climate change, every time we have a frozen winter, they say, hey, okay, you see there, I mean, what, what about climate change? Here, the thing is getting on the opposite direction. It's not. Global warming will, global warming will mean winters, according to this model, much more closer, uh, colder. So, um, but on average, of course, the temperature is increasing. What will happen actually is that some models say that if this, if the Gulf current weakens and we have colder winters in the north of, uh, of, uh, of our hemisphere, it might happen that this could temporarily, I will say, uh, mitigate the global warming until, because it will create, for example, new sea ice, until a new equilibrium is found. Today, this equilibrium is not there yet. So the probable scenario is that in 15, 20 years, there will be no sea ice floating in the Arctic. People now are, I would be very cautious giving you a date, but thing, people say that already 2035, 2040, there might not be any more sea ice floating in the Arctic during summer. And then means that it will be, navigated, be basically navig navigable from, from one coast to another. Now the melting of continental ice of um, of uh, sorry it's not only the sea ice which is melting that generates fresh water water without salts which flows in the ocean the melting of the continental ice of Greenland it's it, an Antarctic we've seen a second are the largest source today of fresh water which is flowing into the ocean the continental glaciers generated by the ice sheet which is this cap in the in the middle of the of Greenland and Antarctica, they are like rivers. They're really taking the ice from the from the from the central part of the continent and they are flowing towards the oceans. Now this is transporting millions of tons of ice every year from inside the continent to the outside. And if I look at the Greenland first, 
and Greenland extends above the Arctic Circle, and uh, it also therefore feels, I would say, the effect of the Arctic amplification. And it's essentially a continent which has ice covers of a few kilometers in the middle. If if all the ice melted, the sea level will rise roughly seven meters. We will come back to this shortly. Now, the image shown here has been created using the data from Cryosat mission. It indicates how, uh, how much ice uh, is melted every year. This value is 250 gigatons. I come in a second what this means. Of course, is, is, is a value which changes in time. Uh, it, it's not fixed because it depends on the number of, uh, uh, of, I will say, elements and variable. This value here is from the latest IPCC, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, sorry. And what you see here as well, the red part shows that the, the, um, the thongs, I will say, of the glaciers, which are going inside uh, into the ocean, are thinning by 10 meters per year. This is a very dramatic situation. And between Antarctica and Greenland, probably who is really suffering today is Greenland. Now, when this ice from the center of the continent goes into water, it of course breaks. Tons of ice goes into the oceans, forming as icebergs and so on. Now, the latest data, as I was saying before, say that on average we are losing 250 gigatons per year, or if you want 250 kilometer, cubic kilometers of ice every year. Now, if I did my home well, uh, homework well, this corresponds like a nice cube, just to give you a perspective what this means, a comparison. But this corresponds to a nice cube extended as a large and greater London, and, and, and it is 150 meters tall. This value, as I said before, can fluctuate. Now, this is happening every year. And now we go very, very fast um, to the South Pole. Now we go to Antarctica, Antarctic continent. Now what's the situation there? Now, it is, Antarctic is a very different from the Arctic. It is a continent covered with a layer of ice up to four kilometers that holds our, the history of our climate up to millions of years, up to a million years ago. While the sea ice, which you have seen this animation, um, it's, uh, it's, it's thinner than the Arctic, and it almost, almost disappears during the summer. Its climate is very different from the Arctic in many ways. It has a continental climate compared to the marine climate of the Arctic, so it's much, much colder. And uh, it has, uh, the continent here has an hydrological system, a living hydrological system, with a comp much more complex than in Greenland. There are, there are lakes, there are rivers, which are all connected between them. Now, the marine currents, on the average, are much colder than what we see in the Arctic, and are controlled by, I'll say, the greatest marine current in the world, which is called the Antarctic uh, Circumpolar current or known by or known by ACC and this is the biggest as I say marine current in our planet and this goes around like clockwise and blocks all the warm all the, um, the the currents coming from the equator so it's like a barrier but this barrier is not working uh, very efficiently recently let's see if I can see that so as I said up to some years ago it was believed that the continent was in climate balance. On the contrary, new data, and Kreiter is displaying a very important role in this, describes the situation which is saying that it's not stable at all. It's not only Kreiter, I must say, but there are also other missions which are proving this. And the proof is given by this ice shelf that broke three years, no, yes, five years ago from, the, from this area here. Now look at this area, again, red means that we are losing ice. And uh, so it, basically this block here, block here, block here, we're losing ice. There was this last and sea platform, which we broke in 2017. And, and just recently, after five years, has stopped very close to the South Georgia and the, and the Sandwich Islands, having lost, I will say, most of its mass and volume. Now, on the average, the contribution of, of Antarctic is slightly smaller, but it's four times bigger uh, the continent is four times bigger than uh, than the Greenland, but the contribution, I will say, it's more or less the same amount of magnitude, slightly less. The main the main 
contribution of the Antarctic ice melt it comes from this area here, which is the eastern part. And this is exactly the part which I showed you at the beginning of the presentation when I, when I mentioned the Arctic amplification, those, that, that arrow, and say, look at this arrow, because here, what we have here, we have warm, we have warm sea. When I say warm, I don't think of 30 degrees. I'm thinking about a couple of degrees higher than the global. So what's happening really is the warmer currents coming from the equator are able to bake the barrier and then trying to arrive to the coast, to the ice shelves, lubrificating the bases of the ice shelves, creating instability, and this leads to, to detachment of large quantities of ice from the continent. I have, I think, a small animation here. There we go. As a recent result, as shown here in this animation, I think this is an image from Sentinel-1, on the, which is another satellite. I forgot to put the, the footnote, but I think it's coming from, from this satellite. Anyway, satellites were able to measure this. Um, emphasis the fact that the detachments of makes part of this complex system over here, and all this system is really unstable. If all, it's not only this, which you see here broken, but it's much more than that. If all this would break, okay, this would lead probably to uh, an ocean um, rise of about one meter on average. And this comes now almost to the end of my, almost to the end of my presentation. And I think I already um, told you, you know this already probably, that one of the most significant and known consequences, let me, talking about water. So the most significant and known consequence of the melting of ice is the rise of the ocean levels. The current value, which is being measured not only by ESA, by, I would say, a dozen of satellites worldwide, and all of them, um, all of them put the data put together give, give us this value. Basically, the current value says that the, the, the oceans are rising by 3.4 millimeters per year. Now, one interesting thing is this table here. Now, the rise of the ocean level is not only due to the melting of the ocean, but also it's due to another effect of the global warming, the thermal expansion of the ocean. Although small compared to metals, water increases its volume and when, it, when it's heated, and to the point that almost 40%, and this is the value you're reading here, is of the of the sea level rise is due to thermal expansion and the rest is done to melting and if i read it on my other on my on a, um, other monitor 22 percent is due to greenland 17 glaciers around the world glaciers also greenland has glaciers which are not linked to the ice sheet and antarctic about 13 percent and again here the question is is the sea level rise go around go around the world the answer is no, and what this image shows here, there are places which is not only three, but go up to 10 millimeters per, per, per year, which means a centimeters. So let me go, and all this is really creating, as you can imagine, a lot of concern. So let me go to my final considerations, and then I go to my final slide. So the melting of the glaciers, and therefore the rise of the ocean level has a strong repercussion, I would say, on our society, a strong impact. We only need to think that 60% of the population worldwide resides on the coast within 100 kilometers, and this is on the threat. And 10% uh, within, within one meter's height from the sea level. You can imagine what this means in 2100, when the models predict that the, the sea level rise could be up to one meter, one meter 20. This means that it will impact not less than a billion people, billion of people, and significant impact as well on the animal life of our planet. There are many cities which are at risk of inundation, such as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Bangkok, Amsterdam, London, Venice, they're all at risk. And the situation can, can get worse because also them, as I said at the beginning, they're also suffering from subsidence, which I mentioned before. So the, incre the increase of sea level sea level uh, will have also an impact on the coast and major erosions of the coast as i said therefore subtracting i will say land to human beings to the man to man to the people with major exposure of this coast to the fragility 
and to the effect of tsunami or extreme weather condition. You don't have to think that the problem is when you see the water on the level of the ground. But if you think of the cities, even by 20 centimeters, let's say another 20 or 40 years, already this means a threat to the cities when you get, I would say, um, when you get small hurricanes or you get uh, extreme events. You, you you're giving the water another 20 centimeters and to, to, to create, I would say, damage. And San Francisco, for example, they're already thinking of, uh, of, uh, of changing, of re redesigning the whole port, basically. All this, and we have more in the future, is, is creating and will create a significant, I would say, effect on the economy of billions of people. And it will be also a political challenge for all nations in the world making climate change, and this probably answer the question, one of the questions I saw at the beginning, making climate change not only, I will say, a matter of investigation for scientists or for experts, but it really affects all, all us. And the important message, the takeaway mission today, before I go to my really last slide, is that what is happening today in the Arctic and in the Antarctic is, is a problem which concerns all of us, even we think we are so away from these, from these lands. So it's a problem which concerns all of us and not only them. And I just want to finish, okay, I just want to finish with a slide which I can imagine uh, is a planet somewhere in the universe. We'll be able to be, we are contacted by them in let's say in another 180 years. And the guys come to us and see us, come to visit us. And just by orbiting our planet, they see a little bit of a mess. And they, hello Earthians, we are the Earthians for them. You look unwell, do you have a virus? And I think the only thing really we can reply today is yes. It is called Homo sapiens. Thank you. Now I hope I have not okay. been muted. Okay. I hope okay. I'm not been muted all the time. So this would be <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would have probably given you a phone call in that case. <laughs> okay, so what was the Last okay. moment? I'm setting up everything. So for your information, you picked up 185 people. I think you beat Paolo Ferri, which was already the record holder from two weeks ago. And uh, and uh, Paolo also, the, you have to look, uh, when, when you have time later, look at the chat. There has been a lot of comments. Uh, and a okay. lot of compliments for this outstanding presentation. And everybody is very happy, very enthusiastic about this presentation. Oh, thank, thank and, you very um, much. Paolo also noted that the picture you showed about the Earth and the Moon with the atmosphere was taken by Rosetta. I was wondering why you know that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, and uh, okay, let's go to the questions. And uh, you ready? And uh, so we read I'm some ready. Um, I'm ready. I'm. There you go. We've got a piece of paper. Let's see. Can I? Where, where do I see the questions? I see. Uh, you can you can also see them, but I have to read them. Okay. And, uh, but if you want, you can also see them if you hit the ask a question below the screen on the bottom of the screen. Okay. So we have um, oh we have a question from Alessandro. This is an Alessandro you know very well. And uh, if you had all the means and resources needed, uh, money, technologies, which Earth observation mission would you suggest to launch in order to complete, increase, enhance data? already provided by the present missions and which observables would you include good question this is a good and difficult question to answer but um definitely uh, oh it's alessandro it's a very really complicated i think the first thing we have to make sure is that what that the observations we are today are continued because um as you and this is very for, very important for for us for the scientific community and sometimes we think that you just launch a mission, you, you measure uh, something and then you forget about it and there's no other mission which can continue data. There are, there are missions like Gorgia in which you just measure the, the gravitational field and you do this once because this is not changed. But if you think of a climate mission like Chrysat <laughs> or any other mission which is measuring import, important climate or say environmental data, it is important that this is 
uh, continue, continued in time. Because climate, for example, does not change every two weeks. Climate, you need a record of at least 50 years to understand what's really going on. So for the first answer to your question is that I would continue, uh, I would launch mission and continue the mission that we have today. Then of course, what what do we need to understand? Well, well of course, today, if we have very little and I would say inaccurate measurements of CO2. And as you know, there are, probably don't know, but there are already some missions in the pipeline. And then there are other missions which uh, today, I mean, gravity, the chain, well, gravity as well could be another mission because we need to understand and complement the altimetry missions to understand how, how much ice is, is melting in the Antarctic and provide more uh, pro provide more information. And then we need probably to understand how our, our biomass is changing. They're all missions already a bit in the pipeline, I, I must say. And as you know, it's very difficult to answer because usually these are, I would say, ideas which comes, which comes from, um, from, um, from, from scientists. Okay, okay. I'm pleased to say that I'm working actually on Earth observation mission right now. This is something new for me. Of and, course, uh, I'm talking about Earth observation. I'm, yes. I'm not going yes, to the yes. science, which is no, um, no, no. not my part. The question, the question was about Earth observation missions. And uh, so I think it's, uh, your answer is to the point. So there, there are many things that can be done, of course. And we have to remind that ESA is a, is a leader in the world about Earth observation, which is very, very important. And also other countries are relying a lot of, uh, on our data. And also Italy, if I can say that, is also an important player in this, especially for certain instrumentation. Some of the instruments you mentioned were built in Italy also. Okay, second question from Keith and others. What effect on Earth science from satellite observation will be the presence of thousands of commercial broadband 5G, for example, SpaceX satellite clusters placed in lower Earth orbit? And second, will 5G communication to from orbit cause interference with science data collection? Now, it depends here what kind of answer you want from me, a political correct answer or what I really feel about it. But because I always say what I think, I think that probably today we are a bit exaggerating with all these uh, clusters of satellites. Uh, of course, it's, it's SpaceX has opened an incredible also, opportunity, and this is really great, thanks to Elon Musk and, and his team, because now the private sector has gone into launch, and this will really boost up I will say the science, but on the on the other hand, we have to be very careful because probably uh, we have to be careful not to pollute without any good reason our our, our space because this will create a, a problem uh, and to satellite uh, is a threat. Uh, to give you one example, that was in 20, 20, 2019, I had to maneuver ALUS because uh, because a satellite of SpaceX, uh, I think, was one of those which did not work when they were launched, were basically hitting, going towards ALUS, and I had to move very quickly the satellite. So it's becoming a threat. We have to be very careful about this and not to pollute our, our space. Now, I can, I can also answer from the astrophotography, or if you want the astronomy, which is me, I am, I am an astronomer by education, and I, and I, I like to, I, I, like, I still like to think that when I open my eyes in the sky, I don't see so too many satellites flowing around, small satellites, because that solution, the solution probably could have been found differently, I don't know, using the moon as a big hub. So communication is important, but at the same time, let's don't forget that we have a planet and we have now the right, I would say the duty to make sure that things that we have today that have been inherited by our fathers and grandfathers are now given to our, our sons and nephews. We have to make sure that we don't pollute too much now our, our space. Thank you. So next question from uh, Isaiah. What, no, sorry, from Pablo. And uh, what kind of instruments are used to, oops, 
What kind of instruments are used to measure the Earth's desertification or growth of deserts, for example? Well, I think the it's uh, the easiest way to measure this is uh, to use, I would say, cameras like optical cameras. And uh, uh, the image I show here was, I think, uh, we have a few we have many satellites, I would say, and that is only we we can measure it at the pixel level. So today we have a resolution which goes up to ten meters per sorry ten meters on ground, but we can even go do better than that. And just by comparing the, 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 what, uh, how, how the green is changing in time, uh, that we can measure that. So I will say optical, optical instrument. But at the same time, we can also use probably um, uh, radar-like in P-band, on in L-band on P-band, which means that we can go into the vegetation and depends on the backscattering, we can say whether this is biomass or it's a soil or it's desert. So there are different instruments which we can use. Yeah, I think change detection in imaging is the very first uh, results you can get very quickly, actually. This is very, yes. we are very well equipped for that also. It's very quick to do. Okay, and a uh, question from Ken. And this is very sobering and important information. How quickly would mitigation activities result in reducing, stopping, or reversing this seemingly inevitable, inevitable progression? Okay, this is really a question for expert, but uh, I'm not, of course, an expert. But uh, I am. I am. I will say, I have vested interest in this, and. Uh, when, when I when, when when I go to these conferences and I ask also this question, it well, it, it's not easy. It's not easy even today. If we stopped producing CO two, which is something impossible to do, okay, this would probably mean another one hundred and fifty years when we revert back. So we cannot change this dramatically. But what we can do, we can mitigate. And if I look at also the European policy, in which they are saying that they want by twenty fifty. A, a, a zero emission CO, not emission, a zero CO2 footprint. This is already something very important. But I give you one thing which really astonished me uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was reading uh, a paper, and according to this study, one of the most important mitigation that we can act, each of us can act, is food. We are wasting every year the amount of food just wasting because we are buying, going to the supermarket, buying food, and to produce food, you are producing CO2. Easy calculations. If you eat meat, you are producing CO2. If you eat anything you eat, anything we do today, even now, the streaming here is unfortunately producing CO2. Now, I read something which really, uh, I read it again and again because the number was incredible. Every year, we are wasting food equivalent to the food produced by 1.5 billion hectares, and I think it's 1.5 the size of Europe. I'm not sure, but when I saw this in the map, it's like a big, big, it's, a, it's very big. Make your calculation, 1.5 billions of hectares, it's the amount of um, food that we are wasting, we are just throwing in our bins, okay, which uh, uh, would be necessary of, uh, of soil to produce that food. It's incredible. Just by trying not to waste food, just to go to the supermarket and buy what you really need, we will basically basically reduce the amount of CO2. Now, I don't remember the number here, if it's 30 million or 300 million. I think it's 30 million. I don't remember the number. It's equivalent to 30 million or 3 million, please don't quote me on that, of the CO2 produced by cars. This is something we can do easily. Uh, there are, of, of course, at the public opinion, usually uh, in the information, the media, they always point at the most likely causes, but there are many other like causes that should be considered there. And also the presentation showed that the interaction of different aspects, it's not only the temperature, it's not only the air, the, it's not only the, the ice, it's a, it's a complex dynamics. This is the realm of geophysicists that do this modeling. Uh, absolutely. And this is a very absolutely. complex... But complex the, the, the food we waste, and not to mention that people are dying of famine because they don't have food, yeah. it's it, it's a failure, I think, of this of this society. It's, yeah. it, it's incredible. But we can still keep producing, but at least distribute it in a better way. So we don't I think we should produce action. less and, and distribute better, probably. It's yes. the right solution yes. for this. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, I agree. Question from Isaiah. 
as a bargaining youth space influencer. What uh, are the uh, top... Sorry, I don't see this. Um... Then, uh, is, uh, is it the top one of the question? Okay, got it. I got it now. Yeah. Please, yeah. What are the top selling points one can convey to one's community on building a space economy or developing space? I will say it's return of a return of investment. Space economy technology is an incredible piece of, uh, I will say, uh, economy in which what you what you put in you get three times better. So, and I'm not talking here about anything about technology, which of course is is incredible. It's important for the for our progress, and uh, so these I will say financial and also technology. Okay. <clears throat> And then this is uh, this is a this is a particular one from Ian Ian, Ian sorry. And uh, have you come across the effect of space weather with the incidence of earthquakes, like a solar CMEs battery effect on the Earth's crust? No, probably this is a question more to Paolo, but uh, I have not. I've I've gone. I have come across the effect of space weather um, many years ago when I was uh, doing. Uh, when I was doing um, space operations, and uh, in particular, we had we sometimes we believe that the incidents that we find on spacecrafts, the this, this famous uh, CUs, um, are caused by protons. Actually, I must say, on, I think on Christat we had an effect of that, but this is because very high um, part, energetic particle can really go inside the instruments and, and create sometimes some shortage and create problems. I have not seen this, this what you say, this link between space weather and earthquakes. Okay. <clears throat> A question from Jas. What is the greatest threat to our planet in the near future? Climate change, indeed. Unless we hit by a asteroid, and uh, unless we hit by another pandemic, which is uh, uh, with a, with a virus which is clever than the one we have now, the problem of this virus, of course, I'm not an expert, is that it's not a clever virus. Is that we are just we are behaving ourselves a little bit stupid. It's a normal virus. Instead, it has a very high potential of uh, of spreading each other. So we have to be careful. But they could they are virus which are much more complicated and difficult than this one. So. Apart from an asteroid, apart from another very difficult pandemic situation, a difficult virus, with, which is difficult to get, I will say, a vaccination, I think the biggest threat. I, I show this in my in one of my slides. I think it was the last one, and it's you got you got these three biggest tsunami coming. The first tsunami is the pandemic. The second tsunami is a bit higher. Is the economic recession, which. It seems it's going to come, but then we have another big, big, really tsunami coming, and this is the climate change, the effect of the climate change, which doesn't mean that we're going to disappear. It means that the effect in terms of loss, I will say, uh, of economy loss is going to be incredible. And this, of course, when this happens, is always the poor people who uh, who are more impacted. Yeah, every time there is an economic loss, there is also life loss in the end. Life loss, if you want. And imagine yes. also the immigration. What they're already talking about climate change, immigration, because there will be places where you have more inundation, you have places where you have more heat, places that you can have 40, 45 degrees, and, and this is going to be unbearable for people. So you have not only what they call the economical immigration, but you're going to very soon have, unfortunately, the uh, climate change uh, immigration. Another question um, uh, from Filippos. To what extent could this data be used to persuade the industry towards reform outside of policy? Well, this data, it's, uh, and he, this data is already being used, uh, I would say, by, um, I would say, the political, I would say, the government, the people who, Governors, I mean the the policy makers, and, um, and if you think of the Copernicus or the, or the Sentinel satellites, the whole scope of this incredible, I will say, endeavor, which we are partner of, is exactly this: to provide to Europe and the world elements, so they can make their decisions. Now, from getting the data and showing the data to create policies, to to say <clears throat> to re, um, to change this trend, this is another story. Okay. 
So we have a question from Elizabeth, our CEO. You met her yesterday and, and yes. today also. And uh, this is fascinating data. It would be great to hear how ESA used this to drive awareness around the world. Uh, it's it here in the, sorry, I don't see it, otherwise you can repeat it again, sorry. Say again, please, uh, Fabrizio. Uh, basically, how ESA uses this, the, this data to drive awareness around the world. Well, it's not, it's not only the ESA who's doing this. I think it's really the scientific community and which is now um, doing this, is, has been doing this, I will say, from, from many, many years. And I will say the awareness today, it's, it's, it's really high. Thanks also to the people like Greta, who has an incredible, I will say, capacity to communicate um, better, I will say, sometimes than scientists and even ESA. So we, each of us, every time we have a opportunity, we, 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 we try to show what we can do but at the end of the day it's always um it's always the policy makers who take the decisions but it's important that we continue with this and i will say i am today i'm more optimistic than i could have been like 10 five years ago <coughs> because there's much more awareness and probably because we are getting close to the I will say the point in which probably we already passed it, the point in which we have no return in terms that we're still in time probably now to try to mitigate it. I'm convinced that we cannot go, we cannot go back, but we have all the tools, all the knowledge, all the technology, and now we need also all the awareness to try to make this disaster a less disaster, a less, so we're trying to make the tsunami less high, I would say. Yes, uh, I think it's important also to avoid panic. Awareness is one thing, panicking people is another, of course. Panicking really doesn't good. help. I mean, panicking, you panic when you don't know the problem. And yeah. uh, when you know the problem, you don't panic, you are afraid of. We say it alla paura, to use Italian word. But uh, panicking is just because you don't know. We were panicking in spring last year because we, don't, we did not know what this virus was how 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 dangerous it was but once we understood uh, the, what the problem is then the panic turns into awareness and it turns into policies good point question from alex which environmental parameters do we understand with the greatest precision and confidence and which parameters the least well, I think the one which we know least because it's difficult to measure, I think, is the CO2 today. Uh, and this is why there's a lot of uh, things going on, research on the side. Um, greatest position depends. Well, altimetry, if you look at the sensors today, one of the greatest precision uh, instruments that we have. This is important. Christ has made a complete change of uh, quantum leap, I would say, in technology because we went from measuring ice with an accuracy of, uh, I would say, a kilometer, kilometer 0.5 to 300 meters. And it's clear that um, the more you can measure, and more accurate are your data, the better is uh, the information you can put in your models. Because models are, by nature, not perfect. If we had models which were perfect, we would not be here today discussing about this. But models need accurate data um, to work well, and because the data will correct the models. And the more accurate information we have, this is the better, for example, for predictions for any field, from climate change to meteorology. So accuracy is important. Yeah, it's fantastic uh, sometimes how just a single mission changes completely our perspective on also other data in the end. And this is something, one of the values, I was talking about this with other people, how the value space mission cannot be measured easily. So we know the value, we know that there is a return to the investment, one to three, and there is also one to ten, there are different statistics, but the overall return to society, it's incredible, it's not measurable because of this knowledge. Okay, another question, I have no name here. Can you detect clot rates and the associated risk of gas release? What is this, sorry? The first one on top, can you detect the clot rates and the associated risk of gas release? Can well, I cannot answer them? because I don't understand what the word means. Um... The clot rates are those things that associate with the CO2 that are inside the oceans. And uh, the risk, there is the risk that the clot rates accumulate inside the ocean, they get to the surface. and then Oh, they... sure, sure, sure. But when we measure this, of course, we... 
this is, of course, we can do that. We can do, we, we want to do this because we're still missing, I would say, a balance of CO2 in the world. As I said, one third of the CO2 is today absorbed uh, by the oceans. The same, if, if we release all the CO2 in the ocean, we'll be, like a, we'll be like Venus today. But at the same time, we need to understand how much, um, how much the ocean with, with certain accuracy is releasing into the atmosphere and how is this is changing the sign because in time because this is an effect uh, a clear effect that also um, things are changing also at the ocean and an effect on the climbing uh, on the on the climate change we are able i think to measure uh, well we're able to measure a lot of gases i just mentioned here um, co2 which is very difficult to do especially it's difficult with a certain accuracy and i think is a <clears throat> And European Union are, are, are trying to, to do this, but we can measure a lot of gas since uh, since the 90s. With uh, and ESA has been a, a fantastic agency in in implementing instruments. We can measure methane, we can measure uh, ozone, we can measure all kind of gas and, pol and uh, pollution, which are which are hopefully are used also by uh, I will say the mayors of the cities and uh, I will say the uh, the countries in order also to to try to prevent. You know, when you see that the city is closed because of pollution, well, 50% of the data is coming from satellite and probably 50% is coming from in ground, on ground, in, in, in situ measurements. Okay. There is one of our members also who participated in the calibration campaign of OLCI, the one of the instruments on Sentinel-3 you mentioned before. And in fact, oh, yes. there's also, also a ground calibration activities which are extensive sometimes in these missions. I, I, I like to say that, I know what the question is, but when you mention calibration, it's always uh, uh, raise my eyebrows. Calibration is fundamental as measuring from, from the space. Without calibration, you will have uh, values, we have uh, numbers which are completely uncorrelated, completely wrong. And today we cannot, um, uh, we cannot afford to have uh, figures which don't have an error associated to it. So calibration, and NASA, JAXA, ESA played an incredible amount of money, I would say, funds in order to make the quality of our data better. This is about calibration, make the data uh, accurate and improve the quality of the data. As I said, quality of data means better models. Yep, I would like to remind everybody, there is a lot of young people maybe, that uh, this is an example yet of how many different professions there are in the space world. To work in, the, in space, you don't have to be an aerospace engineer. You can do yeah. a lot of other things and participate also in this mission with a critical role, even if you are on the ground and you are you're not in, a, in, in an industry, for example. I am an astronomer and I'm talking about Earth, so it's uh, it's already... Yeah, actually, actually, <laughs> there, are, there are just last four questions very quickly, but uh, I want to make a point that the last time we had the Palo Ferri, the, that he is also a physicist and also shares the same university in Italy of the Tommaso. Same in fact, in the fact same they study exactly at the same time. And both physicists, they had two different careers. One flying spacecraft in mission control and the other one doing science, basically, with, uh, with spacecraft, managing spacecraft. And, and, uh, it was good. This is, yeah, this is yet another example of how your degree can bring you in space in a, in a, in a grand way, actually. Okay, so uh, question. I have a question from uh, from Dario. Uh, thanks you for the fantastic lecture. And uh, uh, what can you do to avoid the disaster apart from not wasting food? Because Dario likes to eat, so he's not wasting food, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, it's, well, it's, um, I think this is not easy to answer because it's a, it's a complex, complex matter. I think uh, one thing which we're going to face very soon, if we don't change the way we are producing energy, is the impact of uh, internet on climate change. Now, we are very close today, if I believe, if I remember correctly, the numbers, the amount of CO2 that internet, the digital world, put it this way, is producing, it's close to that produced by the uh, transportation in the world. I think it's about 14%. In 2030, the amount of energy uh, needed uh, for running internet or the digital world will be the, the biggest, which means that internet will slowly becoming, the digital world, sorry, not only internet, coming slowly becoming 
the I would say the, uh, the, the the biggest source of CO2. Now, if you go in on the internet and ask and ask how how many grams of CO2 are produced today by sending an email or even a WhatsApp, probably you will start changing your habit. An email produces around, I think, around 20 grams of 14 for 20 grams of CO2. A WhatsApp around uh, four or five grams. A Twitter around one or two. Why of this? Because the energy we are producing today to run the servers are energy which is produced by um, by uh, uh, by fuel and by uh, and uh, and this produces CO two. The change in paradigm would become when the the source of energy would not be carbon or the petrol or oil. It would be a clean uh, a clean energy. Until that time, I think because of our, because the way the progress is, because the way we live, because the way we travel, because the econ, because the because the industrial revolution in 1958 was because we found the petrol and we were we were burning that. All our economy is based on this. Until we change this, we're going to produce and produce the CO2. I would ask everyone really. Um, um, more or less, I think only on the internet we are producing about 15 kilograms per year. Uh, numbers I rem I was researching some time, but I think this is a more or less the amount 15 kilograms on average per year we are producing of CO2. And if if we ask ourselves, stop from tomorrow uh, using social network, stop from tomorrow using video streaming, stop from tomorrow using Bitcoin. How many of us really are ready to do this? So it's it, because I was, I had a, just a very small um, thing I would like to say. I had a, a presentation once at the university and uh, they were 20, 23 years old. And just the day before they were striking for climate change because of uh, the, um, the the Fridays the days and that's a great uh, I can't remember the names now strike for Fridays and I, and they all they all said to me yes it's your generation which has destroyed this world true but uh, we we are striking for this we want a better generation okay and then we then I went there and tried to calculate how much they are producing just by um, sometime by sending by by their footprint on internet by social uh, the social uh, social media and and I said okay from tomorrow please stop sending uh, um, we talk about hundred they will say 100 120 WhatsApps per day I said okay let's start stopping this now because this is polluting the world let's start reducing by ninety percent. Well, they were not really that convinced because uh, and and I need to accept this and this is the point. I mean, if we really want to change our world, it is really, it's a really hard time to do this because it means that we have to change a lot of habits. Probably, as I said before, the, uh, the, the new energy revolution, which is certainly going to come before the end of the century, will at least help a lot to mitigate the production of CO2 because it is a, a society which needs more energy. But if this energy cannot come from... Uh, uh, from uh, from fuel, from petrol, or from carbon, because this is creating a lot of issues. Okay, thank you. And uh, the question about sea ice and snowfalls during heavily reduced. Uh, sorry, over. Oh, come on, he changed it. So I'm reading the second one. Sea ice snowfall duration heavily affected by particle deposit, so it gets darker, absorb more heat. It melts faster. Is there albedo monitoring to equate pollution with the ice no loss? I'm sure there is because albedo is one of the key indicators for climate change. Because, as I said before, the albedo has an incredible effect on uh, on, uh, on absorbing or releasing the energy coming from the, from the sun in this case. So I'm sure there is. I don't have the numbers here, but they're talking about the dark ice, uh, and this is I think this is what he's referring to. I'm not an expert of this, so I cannot say really much. Okay, another one about aerosol emissions over oceans that are reduced 
with 80 percent within 80 percent from 2020 from new regulations is ESA working on assessing the effects on climate of this oh yes it's really easy let's put it this way ESA is uh, is building satellites it really looks into this on the scientific community and uh, aerosol is another important point because it's uh, it's, 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 it's linked, uh, I would say, to pollution and it's linked to meteorology and it's, it's also linked to climate because, as you know, probably clouds are forming around aerosol. And uh, we know little about clouds and so we don't know what the balance, uh, how much they're contributing to, uh, uh, to climate change. I mean, are they cooling or the atmosphere, are they warming? So, yes, I can tell you that uh, ALUS, for example, is looking at aerosol. So we have already have missions looking at this. And, uh, and another one will come hopefully very soon, which is exactly dedicated to aerosol and cloud formation, which is called Earthcare. So the answer is yes, we are providing the tools, but at the end of the day, it's a scientific community which is making use of the data. Okay, then I have, uh, we have to speed up a little bit because we have just a few minutes left from our 15 minutes left in our connection. But uh, so we have a question from Philip. Some commentators suggest, in terms of climate change, we are already too late to make any significant change to the global warming. Do, do you agree? If not, no. Do you agree? If not, what does ESA think? Sorry. Do you agree? Or maybe uh, I cannot. Do you agree? If system. not, what does ESA if think when the point of no return? Point of no return will be reached. Well, I think ESA can cannot really make any political judgments about this. What we can, what we can, what we can commit is uh, is commit that uh, what uh, the satellites we are we are uh, developing and launching are trying to to answer the questions. Uh, that the scientific community is posing us today. And uh, if, if on, on a personal, uh, I would say, uh, view, I think the return point has already been passed, but that doesn't mean that we are, we, are, we are going to be extinct. I think it's very difficult to go back. The only thing we can do today, and it's already really difficult, is to make sure that we don't uh, uh, arrive to these two degrees at the end of, of the century, because with these two degrees uh, models, we are not perfect, are giving uh, very, I would say, um, very, I would say, very difficult answers to accept because, uh, you know, we have this gap of, uh, uh, with, uh, the, the, the sea level could rise between 80 centimeters and 40 centimeters. So what we need to do is we need, and this is our commitment really today, is to build satellites with the help of the scientific community in order to answer that question. Going, I don't think we can go back. We only can mitigate. And to do this, it's already difficult to do, really. And, yeah. Uh, Europe even, even, yeah, even stabilizing the situation would be already good. It's, it's difficult because, uh, I mean, if you look at the graph of the CO2, despite all the policies, it's, it's still increasing. And uh, the pandemic situation has not helped. Um, actually, it helped a little bit, but we're going back to, uh, we're going back to full speed again. And uh, and again, Europe. Okay, Europe wants to reach the neutral CO2 by 2050. It's fine, but today uh, the biggest producers is not Europe. It's uh, the bigger producers, in terms of uh, global producers, is our, our other countries in the world. And if they don't change, then uh, our contribution will be important but not significant. Yeah, indeed. And also it's important that every things we suggest to reduce the contribution, maybe introduce our effects. For example, using electric cars, that is a big issue on, uh, on, the, um, on the batteries. How do you manage them? That's true, because we have to be careful. Because, you know, sometimes yeah. the marketing tells you the, the half of the story. Yes, but electricity yes. is important. But the problem is, how do you charge your batteries? Which, which electricity yes. do you charge your batteries? Exactly. You... It's, a system. it's a system issue. So I think you, you really have to see from the, the whole production chain, and not to mention, not to mention, how do you, uh, what do you do with the batteries at the end? How much they pollute? How can they be uh, regained? I, I don't know, but we don't. We only see one part of it. It was like plastic at, at, at the 70s or the 60s. Plastic is going to revolutionize the world because it weighs less. You can produce a lot of objects. Um, you can basically the, the, the amount you can contain it whatever you want, and it is not made of uh, 
uh, of, uh, I would say it's, it, it was a kind of revolution, but no one thought what happens to the plastic when you don't use it anymore. Now we have learned this and I hope this kind of thinking of uh, going also to, um, to cars with electricity, we have to think uh, what happens afterwards? Where does the energy coming? It's, it's really an end-to-end -end thinking. We cannot stop in the middle because if we stop to the middle, as we have stopped so far, we will lose the we will lose the far end, and that usually is the worst part of the story. Okay. How can you cool? This is a question from Stephen. How can you cool the planet from space? Your future satellites for terraforming, for instance? Sorry, Stephen, I don't understand the, the question how you cool the planet from space. Your future satellites for terraforming, not uh, clear what that imaging, means. Just imaging acting globally, so for example, shielding the sunlight to cool the Earth. This, uh, it's, it's beyond my, my, my knowledge. and uh, Beyond my knowledge, I mean, uh, I don't know. I really don't know how to, how to do this. And, uh, um, I know this is the this is the BIS. We are visionary, you know. That. I know. I, I'm 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 happy about that. I mean, I I, I but it's it's really beyond. Um... I think I think that if we don't really know very well how to model the Earth, it's very risky to to play with these kind of things. It's it's very risky. It's very risky indeed. So okay. we need more data. What is the biggest gap in our understanding? when it comes to modeling the climate this is from alex data data the accuracy on one and also because i asked this question once to an expert of models and he said more or less um that i mean we, we have computers today which are which to our knowledge are able to model um climate meteorology but it is a first of all it's a chaotic system i'm not an expert on this i'm just trying to to report what what, what i know about this which came also to a question I asked. I said, well, we, the physics we know today, I think it's quite known how the things work, but it's a chaotic system. And in order to do this, it's uh, even, you need to know what are your initial conditions. And even if you know your initial conditions and the accuracy, you still have a chaotic system, which means that the prediction cannot go beyond a certain accuracy at the end. This is why we have all these models, which are all great. No one is this perfect because, because it's not perfect because if you, look at, if you look at the results at the end, some of them must be right or some of them must be close to the, uh, to, to, to the reality. But some of them are very wrong. And what was the problem is a little bit of the fact that the knowledge of the system is not known 100%, although we are very close to it. But the real problem is the accuracy of the information we are providing in the model. This is why we need to really invest in, in data and quality of data. Which means also in technology, new sensor, so new mission. All this. I mean, I, for me, data means is the final product of, of something which starts 20 years before we get the number. Of course. Of course. And then I have, uh, pro I don't know, there is last two questions. Thank you for your lecture from BM. How much does the Earth have to get worse for man to become extinct? This is, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I, I really don't know. It, it is clear that um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite serious here. I, I, I think that we have reached the point today that we know that there's a problem out there. And as I said before, uh, we are made in such a way that when we understand there's a problem, we are trying to... Uh, to not res well to mit not to resolve it to mitigate it. So I don't think uh, people will be extincted because of climate change, but probably climate change will will impact us the life of our children a lot. And at the end of the day, uh, if you had this question like I would say 13 months ago, I probably would answer the same. But after one year of uh, of a pandemic situation, I could also add. It's 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 difficult. It's difficult because you can get something which is uh, unknown. Unfortunately, it's not only the asteroid. The asteroid was on Earth, and uh, this uh, this situation has created a lot of distress among the people. And again, uh, we I think at the end of the day, uh, let me say that we are a bit lucky because we could have a a, a worse virus than what we're having today. Think of Ebola, but with the same capacity to spread. So let's not look at outside. I think the aliens are in-house. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
And uh, I think also if we earth uh, Mansa is reduced, of course, there is a balancing effect on the environment. So probably this is going to be mitigated. But an asteroid or a virus are more serious and really. Well, asteroids, you know, it's like. Uh, well, yeah. I want to apologize if I was not able to answer all your questions, but um, I try to. And uh, I hope. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I have a final one from Steve, you know Steve, and, uh, and uh, he has an idea. What uh, could large, uh, usually uninhabited, uh, very high sun receiving areas on Earth to be used to build the simple reflectors to increase our albedo, so to reflect the heat of the sun? This is a simple implementation of this shielding. Is again the shielding coming back? Uh, probably yes. It's, um, it's I, I don't think technologically this can be done, but we need to, to do some calculation really simply to see how much this uh, can help. It's uh, Steve. So I think it can be done. I am, really don't know whether this could mitigate with the problems we have today. This we really need some expert on this. Okay, I think we're well, done because we only have a few minutes left for Alistair to. Personal thanks from myself, Thomas, of course, and uh, I leave okay. the word to Alistair now. Well, thank you very much, Tomato. That was fantastic. Um, fascinating, but rather frightening. And your detailed answers to the many questions was superb. Um, I was actually going to ask how much nuclear power contributes to global warming, but I won't get you started on that one just yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad to see that Aeolus is working well. I remember writing the press release when we signed the contract with ESA in June 2002. Wow. And it was launched in 2018, so 16 right. years 16 in development. 16 years, 16 years to build a satellite. It was really exceptional because the mission well, the satellite I know what, is exceptional. I had to follow it every inch of the way, and uh, I know the laser caused the biggest problem. It's still causing. <laughs> uh, thank you. I don't don't go into that. Um, but anyway, thank you also to Fabrizio for the introductions and for coordinating the Q and A, and also to uh, Elizabeth for coordinating the event behind the scenes. If you've enjoyed tonight's talk and want to make a donation, please click on the donate button. Every little helps to cover our costs. Uh, with Fabrizio's help, we have more talks lined up. The next is on Wednesday, the 17th of March at 1800 GMT. Yes, it's still GMT because we don't do summertime until the weekend after. And we've got Francesco Castellini, who's going to be, uh, he's from the ESO, ESOC flight dynamics uh, side, and he will be talking about flight dynamics operations for deep space missions. The details are already on the website and in the latest issue of Spaceflight. Then My on personal, the 12th of April. Sorry, Alistair. Yeah. Sorry, Alistair. Personal recommendation don't lose that one. It's going to be particularly interesting. It That's will. We'll, we'll all learn something from that one. Yeah. Never was much good myself. Um, <laughs> right. Well, Beyond the Moon Symposium is on the 12th of April. And we're still looking for a couple more papers, if you've got them, on the medical side. Looking very much as. Uh, how we uh, survive on long distance flights, radiation, uh, lack of gravity, infection and loneliness, etc., the mental states. Well, we've got some fantastic papers already contributing to this on space colonies, interplanetary spaceships, launching from the moon, cities on Mars, and religious beliefs and deep space mi missions. So there's a lot to be discussed on this event. Now, after that, we're expecting to run an event for the uh, 60th anniversary of man's space flight, his first space flight by Yuri Gagarin. And we'll be celebrating this Yuri's night with a virtual party after the conference. So please join us. We also hope to celebrate another anniversary on the 12th, the 40th anniversary of the STS space shuttle. But as we'll all be rather busy on the 12th, we're trying to set up an evening lecture on either the 13th or 14th of April. So uh, I'll be asking Fabrizio for help on that one. And the reminder then is the 28th to 30th of June uh, is going to be Reinventing Space Conference. And it is going to go ahead. We hope it will be face-to-face -face in the QE2 Conference Center. And papers are already in, and it's looking like a fas fascinating conference. And finally, I'm going to thank you all for participating in the Sir Arthur Clarke Award. We've had 
about 169 entries so far, and about 77, 78, maybe 82 uh, actual nominations. So that's really fantastic. And we'll be getting the judges to do their work over the next few months and have the answers for the dinner at the QE2 Conference Center on the 29th of June. So hope to see you all there. Thanks a lot. And thanks for a great evening. And thanks all for participating. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Aiste. Thank you, Tomas, again. Bye to all. Thank you, Tomas.